Order members. The Speaker has also received notice from the Finance Minister that he wishes to make a statement. Minister. I wish to provide members with an update on the 2020-21 January monitoring round. Members will be aware after the October monitoring round £100 million of COVID funding was held in reserve. All other available resource funding had been allocated and Capital Dale was overcommitted by £12.7 million. On 5 November, the British Government announced a further £400 million in COVID resource funding. On 23 November, the Executive agreed allocations which included £300 million of support for businesses. £150 million was held in the hope that it could be carried over for rate support in 2021-22. £26 million of resource was held in reserve to meet any unforeseen emerging pressures over the remaining four months of the year. Shortly before Christmas, the Treasury increased the COVID, guaranteed COVID funding available to the Executive to £3 billion, an uplift of a further £200 million. Due to the late stage of the financial year in which this has been provided, it is anticipated that the Treasury will agree to our request to carry this forward. Therefore, this amount has not been considered as part of this monitoring round. Departments have declared significant level of reduced requirements in relation to previous COVID allocations, resulting in £219.2 million resource uh, being available for allocation. In view of the additional two hundred million now available, which the executive should be able to carry forward to next year, I have made the hundred and fifty million pounds previously held for further rate support available for allocation now. Reduced requirements for totaling one hundred and five point four million resource have been declared by the Department for the Economy, the most significant of which is the ninety three million pounds allocated for the High Street Support Scheme. The Department of Health has surrendered ninety million pounds of the funding previously provided for the COVID response. It has now been confirmed that the Treasury will directly fund pressures arising from an increased carry forward of annual leave, and this, along with the contribution for the Department for Transport for airport support, will free up £66.6 million of previously allocated COVID funding. Latest forecasts of the regional rate income show that £46.4 million previously provided for rate relief measures will not now be required, reflecting a reduced cost rather than a reduction in the support being provided. Taking account of these changes, the total amount of COVID funding available for allocation is now £509.8 million. The £60 million previously held centrally to support business and the £1.6 million held for the transport sector have now been provided to the Department of the Economy and the Department of Infrastructure. In addition, departments have bid for a further £215.6 million in relation to COVID support. And while ministers are considering what further support can be provided, it is important that there is no delay in delivering the support already identified. Therefore, departmental bids have been met in full. Details of the allocations are shown in the tables provided with this statement. Including the £60 million previously held centrally, the Department for the Economy has been provided with £154.5 million to provide much-needed support to individuals and businesses in the financial year. This includes further support for tourism and hospitality, small businesses and company directors. The Department for Education will receive £7.5 million to continue the response to COVID-19 in schools and to extend the Lost Learning Programme to special schools. My own department will receive £101.6 million, including £100 million to extend the localised restriction support scheme in view of the new restrictions, and £0.6 million to provide rate relief for local newspapers, which are a key part of the fabric of our society. The Department for Infrastructure will receive £20.1 million to help address the impact of COVID on that department. And there remains some £294 million of COVID funding available for allocation, and I have asked all ministers to bring forward proposals for further support as a matter of urgency. Turning now to non-COVID spending, departments have surrendered £93.9 million resource Dell, £55.7 million capital Dell, and £12 million financial transactions capital in this exercise. On resource deal, reduced requirements include £23.8 million declared by the Department of Health, £10.9 million from the Department of Finance, reflecting the anticipated return of rate relief funding from large supermarkets, £8 million declared by the Department of Communities as a result of housing benefit for tenants being lower than forecast, and £3.5 million due to delays in recruiting staff for universal credit due to COVID. The Executive Office has surrendered £8.3 million in relation to funding for the historical institutional abuse and a total of £9.5 million has been returned by the Department for Agriculture, Environmental and Rural Affairs and the Food Standards Agency in relation to the executive funds provided to give certainty ahead of Treasury funding providing related, provided funding in relation to the Brexit protocol. 
The Department of Education has surrendered $16.2 million in relation to the Education End of Year Flexibility Scheme, a mechanism to facilitate local management of a school's budget. On the capital deal, the majority of the reduced requirements are a result of project delays, but also reflect some additional receipts. The Department of Health has surrendered £19 million as a result of delays in ICT projects. In the Department for the Economy, a reduced requirement has arisen as a result of a £7.8 million repayment of the loan to the Presbyterian Mutual Society. Factoring in changes to centrally held funding, there is a £110 million resource deal, £46.4 million capital deal, and £55.7 million financial transaction capital of non-COVID funding available for allocation in January monitoring. Departments have bid for £98.2 million resource deal, £24.2 million capital deal of non-funded uh, of, sorry, of non-COVID-related pressures. However, some of these pressures have been funded directly by the Treasury, leaving the remaining pressures of 58.4 million resource deal and 18.1 million capital deal. These bids have been met in full, and the allocations include 9.7 million to the Department of the Economy for higher education quality research and further education colleges pay remit. 45 million has been allocated to the Department for Infrastructure to support the Driver and Vehicle Agency and TransLink. A detail of these allocations is shown in the table accompanying this statement. In order to ensure transparency, the funding provided in relation to COVID response and that from the executive existing funds has been separately identified. However, it is the overall financial position which should ultimately be considered. After meeting all the department bids and taking COVID and non-COVID funding together, there is unallocated funding of £346.4 million resource deal, £28.3 million capital deal and £55.7 million of financial transaction capital. I have encouraged my executive colleagues to utilise the funding available in this financial year. A number of significant proposals have already been identified, which the executive will consider later this week. In addition, alongside the Scottish and Welsh finance ministers, I have requested incre- increased flexibility to carry forward COVID funding, and I expect a response from Treasury shortly. Cormagat, Lascan Corral. I now call the Chair of the Finance Committee, Steve Aiken. Uh, thank you very much indeed, and may I thank the Minister for meeting with me earlier today. And probably one of the more unusual conversations we'll ever have with the Finance Minister and the Chair of the Finance Committee is how we get to spend an underspend of a close on £435 million in a very, very short period of time. Mr Deputy Speaker, I think the Committee would welcome that all the departmental bids have been met in full, including particularly a further £100 million for the COVID localised restriction support scheme, the replacement funding for the European Social Fund, the £20 million for the company's director's scheme, as well as the Treasury's capital funding for improved broadband through Project Stratum. There are, however, a number of features of this monitoring round which make it very unusual and worthy of deeper scrutiny. Firstly, the Minister advises of £200 million of reduced COVID resource requirements and £100 million of non-COVID reduced resource requirements. After all of the allocations have been made, this has left over 346 million of resources which are still available after this, the final monitoring round of the financial year. That in itself is remarkable. However, this of course has been a remarkable financial year for all, unfortunately, for the wrong reasons. In terms of questions, can I ask the Minister if, given the very substantial sums that are left unspent, is the Department to undertake another monitoring round before the end of the financial year? And will he make a further statement on the anticipated other allocations in a timely manner? Can the Minister also advise on the likelihood of a substantially increased carryover facility for unspent funding into the next financial years? This is particularly important in areas of health. Will such carried over amounts be hypothecated as COVID, or will the Executive have full discretion in respect of its spending? I welcome the discussions the Minister is having with the other Finance Ministers, but obviously it would be very welcome if we had a statement from the Treasury sooner rather than later if we were capable of doing this. Can the Minister also explain something about some of the other issues? And I will be brief, Mr Deputy Speaker. I refer to the £35 million of reduced capital requirements relating to ICT projects in different departments. Can the Minister advise, is there a department-wide problem getting ICT project money spent, as there appears to be? And finally, can he explain about the allocations from the Treasury in respect of the £8.5 million for annual leave accrual 
in the departments for the economy, education and infrastructure. The reduction in the taking of annual leave in year appears to coincide fairly neatly with the reduction in sick leave which NISRA has reported in the civil service in the first quarter of this financial year and coinciding with the lockdown. Can the Minister therefore advise if there is a problem with the management of civil service sick leave and annual leave? The, the, the member has asked several questions there. Uh, latitude is given to chair of committees, but I would urge all members and chair of the committees to be more concise. Minister. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much, Minister. And I must indeed thank the Deputy of the Committee M- Minister, for his remarks. Minister, order, order. We're at question time here. Min- question to the Minister. <laughs> Minister. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, I thank the chairman for his, his range of questions. I, I'll try and deal with them as, as briefly as I can. Uh, the first question was, would we be doing a further monitor round? Uh, as I had advised him, my intention is, and of course this is a matter for the executive to agree, uh, but uh, given the, the, the amount of money that we, we, we need to spend out before the end of the financial year and the shortness of time uh, that we allocate uh, as, as schemes come in, rather than and, kind of corral them all into a single statement. But there may be an opportunity at, at various stages during that to make uh, additional statements, which he went on to ask. So I, I don't anticipate another monitoring round, but I do anticipate keeping the, the Assembly and, and obviously exec- with executive approval, uh, the, uh, the Assembly advised and the Finance Committee in particular advised in relation to spending over the next number of weeks. Uh, the, the question in terms of carryover, of course, we, we are alongside Wales and Scotland, who are facing similar issues in terms of, uh, of trying to deal with the, the COVID allocations they have had. Uh, our pressing Treasury for uh, flexibility to carry over more. We, we have some degree, I suppose, of assurance in terms of the money we received very late on, just prior to Christmas, £200 million. Uh, some degree of assurance in that, but of course, uh, I think the more that we could carry over into the new financial year of the money that we have available, then the the better for us, because we face very significant pressures next year. Now, the question around discretion in terms of how that is spent uh, is something that we will have to bottom out with Treasury once we we get the flexibility explored. But I do expect to hear something from them uh, this week. Uh, and, and I, of course, I can advise uh, Assembly once, once I do hear that. The uh, ICT, the, the, the issue that I related to in the statement was specifically in relation to the Department of Health, uh, and so I don't know if it points up to any bigger particular problem across departments uh, other than that, but we can certainly make some inquiries. And the annual leave uh, accrual, uh, these were costs that people had set aside COVID money for, but were then met by Treasury. So there was a range of costs that had been met by Treasury, I think it meant some 60 odd million, which then meant that that money was back in the pot again for dispersal as part of COVID, which added uh, to our pot. So whether that is uh, the, the cost in terms of reduction of that, uh, and the costs that have been met by Treasury, obviously, in relation to some of that, but uh, whether that coincides with the sick leave issue. Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, we're going to have to, I suppose, analyse that. But I, I'm not, I know that there has been a reduction in sick leave over the course of the year, uh, and perhaps that does. I think maybe point to a way of working going forward. And I've no wish to extend this, but the flexibility that people have working from home and be able to do family arrangements perhaps does lead to a reduction in sick leave, where people are obliged to take that to meet other family pressures. Uh, so I think we will be into different ways of working when we come out the other side of this pandemic and, and hopefully better ways of working which are more productive for our staff all around. I call Paul Free. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Four hundred and thirty million unallocated. Three hundred and forty six million of that is resource. The Health Minister, with all the department's pressures on waiting lists, has returned ninety million alone. What explanation goes from this House and this Finance Minister to the plethora of people who have been deprived of earning a living, of providing for their family, who have received very little support this past month, if at all, and all the people relying on health care at this time, waiting, sitting, waiting on waiting lists. What explanation, Minister, can you give? Well, in relation to people who have not yet received support, I have asked, firstly, I have urged all ministers to come forward uh, with propositions to spend this money. as I said in the, at the beginning of my statement, in November we had allocated all the COVID money available to us. 
Uh, so there wasn't a question of people sitting on this pot and then running out of time at the end of the year. We had allocated all bar 150 million we were carrying over for rates relief next year, which was something that was very widely requested by the business community, and 26 million. We actually had a concern that we left ourselves short if we ended up in a situation post Christmas uh, where we had now the situation we're in of, of extended lockdown uh, scenario. Uh, so uh, the. I have asked ministers to bring forward propositions to assist in spending this out. I have asked them to prioritise sectors within their remit that have not yet received funding for whatever reason. And some schemes are very difficult to put together. Uh, verification of who is in various sectors and how much they have earned or lost, uh, all of these things are very challenging. But I have asked people to prioritise, in particular those who have not yet received any support, uh, because I think they would be most aggrieved if we ended up uh, with some return money at the end of the financial year. In relation to the Health Department, uh, I mean, it will be up for the Minister for Health to explain, uh, I suppose, wh where the, the 90 million was surrendered from. I have to say, though, uh, uh, and I mean, this is just my general experience, the Health Department and Health has been so under resourced for many years that their ability to do too many things at one time is severely restricted because capacity is not there. That is a consequence of years and years of austerity cuts to the Health Department. Uh, and it is not a consequence just of this year, because the Health Department struggles every year with winter pressures, and this year they have a pandemic on top of that. So the ability to concentrate in other areas in terms of waiting lists and things like that, I have no doubt have been very challenging, but the Health Minister could explain all of that better. I call John O'Dowd. Minister, students have had an awful year. They are paying rent for accommodation they cannot use. Their educational experience is less than optimum, despite the best efforts of their tutors. Uh, and their colleges and, and universities. Minister, would you look sympathetically on a bid from Diane Dawes, the Economy Minister, if she was to come forward with a bid to compensate our students for their rent and tuition fees? Well, uh, I concur with them uh, entirely in, in relation to the difficulties students have faced. Many people, uh, I suppose, like the rest, was not known the course the pandemic was going to take undertook. Uh, contracts for rental of properties, which they then weren't able to, to use, and uh, their ability to attend uh, schools and get the, the adequate level of, of, uh, of tuition that they, they would have expected in normal circumstances has obviously been much uh, restricted. And, and as a consequence, hardship among students has grown, uh, and the, there is evidence for that. So I have spoken to the Economy Minister. I have said that I think students is one area where they should uh, try and identify some additional uh, support. I think she is intent on doing that, so I look forward uh, to some bid from her. Quite precisely what it is intended to address, I suppose, would be a matter for the Department for the Economy. But I would encourage them to talk to student organisations uh, and to get some advice from them as to where the pressures are being most felt by students at this time and to make sure that they apply sufficient resources to try and address that. I call Matthew Toole. Thank you, um, Deputy Speaker. I, I don't know uh, whether the Finance Minister is a Pink Floyd fan. Uh, or whether he's ever listened to Dark Side of the Moon, but when I look through the monitoring returns, I'm reminded of the lyric minister uh, plans that either come to naught or half a page of scribbled lines. Notwithstanding the incompetence of departments like Economy and the indifference of London, wasn't it the job of his department to corral a single strategy to make financial allocations to get us through this COVID crisis? Uh, when will he come forward with that plan? And will he guarantee that we'll avoid the huge underspends that now I'm afraid look very likely? Well, I am a, a fan of Pink Floyd, and I have listened to Dark Side. I, mean, I can't recall that particular lyric. I have to say, but I obviously haven't listened to it enough. Uh, but can I say uh, he knows this because he's been in for every statement I've done in relation to COVID allocations over the course. We have received over the course of the year funds with literally maybe two days' notice. So when we did all of the allocations in October. We then received a further four hundred million pounds in November. We then received a further two hundred million pounds in relation in, in December. So the ability to do uh, any uh, financial plan as to how we were to spend out all of that uh, was um, is impossible because we have never had any advance notice of the totality of what we were receiving. When we did receive some funds at the, at the end of the summer, in my recollection, we were told that that was it for the year. And in October, we had allocated all of the money available to us. In November, we received an additional £400 million, and we allocated all of that. Uh, what we have now and what we are dealing with now is returns from departments who bid for funding to say, give us this money, we can spend it on X, Y and Z uh, schemes, and they now have returned that to us. So that is the difficulty we face. It is not a lack of allocation of money over the period of time, even though it came to us 
uh, with no for forewarning, uh, with no ability to plan out what was available over the course of the year. Had we been told at the start of the financial year, as we entered the pandemic, we were getting three billion over the course of the year, I'm sure the executive could have. Uh, uh, put together a plan in order to spend that out, but we never had any notice of what the totality of the amount would be. Yet we did manage to allocate all. What we're now dealing with is returned uh, from the department's allocations, which they haven't spent. I call Andrew Muir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, back in September, I asked the Communities Minister about the risk of handing money back to Treasury, and she responded and said, "No surrender." and that it would be a mortal sin to hand money back. It is very disappointing that that risk is now real. Can I ask the Minister, um, in relation to the LRSS and CBRSS grant schemes, they are very welcome for businesses, but they do not cover all the overheads. Has consideration been given to making a one-off top-up payment to assist those businesses? Well, can I say in relation uh, to those, and uh, I'm sure ministers, in all, with all good intent, did intend to spend the money they have. Some of the, the funding they got is demand-led, uh, and I, I know, for instance, in particular, the, uh, the retail, non-essential retail, uh, we were expecting a very significant demand for support of that pre-Christmas, which didn't actually materialise. So we can't go out there and force businesses to apply for some schemes that either you make a, a, an assumption. Uh, and I'm sure similarly with communities that there are some uh, things that, that didn't materialise the way they had anticipated. But nonetheless, it does leave us with a significant problem, which we, we have to address. In relation to the LRSS and the, the, the economy scheme, we have sufficient funds because now we're into a much more extended period of lockdown and, and some are suggesting, uh, certainly the Health Minister suggested in his last public commentary on this, that you know, even to where he has now brought us in terms of their recommendation to March, that we could be looking at the other side of Easter, possibly. So there will need to be sufficient funds to continue to roll out the payments that we've already established to them. So the ability to make a, a one-off then a higher level payment in relation to that is restricted. But we are looking, uh, and this morning I was engaged with senior officials in the department, to look at where we can get support out to businesses through the information that has been gathered over the year by LPS in terms of the work they've done with a whole variety of businesses. And there are some businesses who didn't avail, for instance, of the 10 and 25k grants earlier in the year who were above the level of the threshold for that, and they are continuing to struggle. So that's a particular area that we may look at. But uh, we will do all we can, I can assure you, to try and get support out where it's needed. I call Paul Given. Uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, I have some sympathy for the arguments the Finance Minister makes around the late notice. Um, of receiving additional funding from Treasury. However, the public won't have any sympathy. Uh, and when they hear the 430 million global figure, they'll be rightly outraged if this money is not spent, given the executive's decisions to close down businesses, to deprive people of a living. So there is a really big onus upon the finance minister to lead the executive to get this money out. In doing that, whilst departments can make bids, will the minister in his own department amend the LRRS scheme to support sports clubs? Will he take forward a scheme for travel agents, which I know he met in November, who have asked for a scheme, who have been decimated and had to refund a lot of people that had made bids? And will he ensure that the Department of Health commission the private sector? Because individual citizens are commissioning the private sector, and there is capacity to do surgeries. It is wholly unacceptable that the Department of Health has handed back £90 million when people should be getting surgery, if not through the NHS, through the private independent sector. Well, can I say, in, in relation uh, to his general points, I am leading the response in, in the executive. I have uh, spoken uh, at length in the last number of executive meetings about the need uh, for all ministers to get uh, their departments going and get, get this money allocated out. Uh, I have spoken about the priority being given to people who haven't received support uh, before. In relation to the sports sector, I mean, there are sports funding available through the, Depart the Department for Communities, which do take into account loss of income, uh, a loss of revenue, for including hospitality parts. So it's the, uh, because the difficulty for LPS in relation to that is that the, the hospitality side of a sports complex, whatever it is, should it be a soccer ground or a, a Gaelic ground or a rugby ground, is often a very small part of it and is not independently rated from the rest. 
so there is a problem there. So they, in order to ensure there is, if you like, a one-stop shop for sports organisations, department communities will handle that, and they will allocate according to lost income, including lost income from hospitality. In relation to the travel agents, I have every sympathy. I have met them. Uh, I have asked my own officials to work with them in the absence of any other department standing up. It is not our responsibility, but I asked my officials to work with them to gather up the information. Again, the difficulty is we have only one paying out agency, which is LPS, which is actually a rates collection agency which repurposed itself to pay out. Uh, but most of these people, are uh, certainly a strong proportion of them, do not operate from a premises. They operate from their houses. They operate online. So therefore, they do not have a, a premises which we can attach a payment to. Uh, so I have asked the Economy Minister to uh, come forward, because that is a, a definite sector that have missed out, uh, and to come forward with a scheme in relation to that. And I hope uh, that over the course of this week we will see uh, some attention drawn to that, because uh, there, there are a small number of sectors that have, for one reason or another, missed out, and the travel agent sector is certainly one of them, and I have every sympathy for finding support for them. I call Arlia Flynn. I thank the Minister for bringing the statement to the House today and indeed for all of the work that, that he has done over these, um, these past number of months. Would the Minister um, agree with me that some of the, the COVID money that is available to the Executive um, could be or should be used uh, to award a thank you payment to all of our health and social care workers, including our student nurses and our domiciliary care workers, um, basically as a, a gesture of gratitude from all of us? Um, to say thank you for the enormous um, work that they've been carrying out over the past 10, 11 months um, during this unprecedented health crisis. Thank you. Well, can I say I'm, I'm very sympathetic to that idea, and it has been discussed at the executive. And I know the health minister is looking very closely at a proposition in that regard. Uh, I think he has the resources within his own department to do that. And uh, I, I spoke to him at the last executive meeting about that because it's something that I think there's a broad level of support across the executive for. So I would hope to see that uh, proposals around that come forward in the not too distant future. I, I neglected to answer Mr. Gibbons' last question in relation to the health department. I apologise it, it went out, but I, I can't direct the health department what to do. Uh, I mean, others will have to raise questions and issues with the health minister. Part of our our, our, our rules of the departments here is that ministers do have autonomy, which is a good thing in many regards. Uh, and so it will be up to the health department to bring forward propositions. But the point I made to Mr. Frew, uh, I have no doubt that there is capa our capacity issues in the health department to, be, to deal with more things, more than one thing at once, uh, and that is a consequence of years of austerity policies. I call Gary Middleton. Thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Um, the Minister will be aware that many of the public will be concerned about the uh, currently over £400 million that is currently unspent. Uh, would the Minister agree and, and would he be able to address the situation where, for example, the Economy Department, approximately £90 million of theirs was for the voucher scheme, uh, the lack of flexibility for being able to move that ring fence funding into other areas within the Department? Is that something that the Minister can address? Because that would go some way in ensuring that money can be spent. Well, I think we did address some of the, the issues with the Department of Economy in terms of ring fence and uh, money that they had in flexibility. But the voucher scheme, and we pressed them very hard to try and at least do some portion of the voucher scheme in this financial year to spend out some of the money, but it wasn't possible. So if they had come forward with any ideas to spend out any of that, we would absolutely have supported that. And we give them flexibility in relation to some other uh, COVID money that they had. Uh, but the, 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 and that's why we will continue to press Treasury, because while we have money to spend this year, which has come very late on in the financial year to us, uh, we have a real challenge next year because we have a poor budget settlement for next year. Uh, and so the more we can get flexibility from Treasury to carry over into the new financial year, then the more pressures that can ease on departments uh, in the next year. I call Sinead Innes. I get uh, last can call you, and the minister's statement is very welcome indeed. Um, Mr. Deputy Speaker, January monitoring is often a, a time when um, when funding is allocated to repair roads. Now, I notice that the infrastructure minister has not made any bids, uh, any, any funding bids in that regard, which is disappointing because I know many roads in South Down could certainly benefit from funding uh, of that nature. Would the minister be open to allocating funding? Um, for this purpose, if you did receive a bid from the Minister for Infrastructure. Thank you. Uh, yes, I certainly would. Uh, I mean, I live in South Armagh where the roads are equally bad. Uh, but I, I, I know that the officials were in front of the Infrastructure Committee and they seemed to indicate there was some capacity issue in terms of, of getting 
uh, money out on the ground uh, and spent in terms of roads maintenance and, and resurfacing and all of the other things that traditionally road service would have done in the first couple of months uh, of a new year, the end of the financial year. Uh, I, I think that the, there was a discussion, and I think the Minister indicated that she had received sufficient money over the course of the year and didn't require any further money uh, in relation to roads. So that's a matter, I think, that would have to be taken up with the Department for Infrastructure. But if there were further bids coming in, of course, I'd look favourably on them. I call Sinead McLaughlin. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your uh, statement and answer so far. Uh, Minister, the Finance Minister in Wales, Rebecca Evans, last week announced a £40 million a coronavirus student support scheme. Um, she indicated that it was vital to support people currently in education, and she also indicated that it would help tackle inequality by ensuring that the most vulnerable students um, affected by the pandemic would complete their studies, help them support complete their studies. Minister, why can you not do the same here um, in Northern Ireland for our students in Northern Ireland that have been so adversely affected by this pandemic, are paying for accommodation they can't even stay in, are unable to claim any benefits and um, can't even carry out any uh, part-time work because obviously hospitality and retail are closed. If it's within the remit of the Welsh Finance Minister, why is it not within yours? Well, uh, can I say that I, I, I'm, not, I'm not surprised that the Welsh Finance Minister announced the allocation, but I, I'm sure she didn't bid for it. I'm sure she didn't devise a scheme for it. So uh, the Welsh uh, system, uh, and I don't know it intimately, will have the Finance Minister doesn't deal with students. Uh, they, what they do is they accept a bid and they'll make an announcement to the money that they have in terms of the funding that they have allocated towards that. So as I had answered to my colleague here uh, in one earlier question, it will be a matter for the Minister for the Economy and I have, I have urged her uh, in recognition of the particular problems that students are facing to bring forward uh, a bid for further support to them. Uh, and I would look very favourably on, on that and make a recommendation to the Executive. But it's, I can't go into the Department of the Economy and devise a programme for students because it's not within my remit and I would be fairly sure it isn't within the remit of the Welsh Finance Minister either. What they have done is they have announced the money that the bid has come out of the Department of Responsibility for Students in Wales for uh, and similarly I'm very happy to look at any bids for the Department of Economy in relation to students. I call Gordon Dunn. Deputy Speaker and I thank the Minister for his statement. I do welcome the, your commitment on the rates for businesses which will, I understand, continue into the new financial year. But would you take some responsibility for the delay in, in the, the build-up there has been in the underspend? Certainly from the Department of Economy, uh, several bids were undercut and not fully funded. For example, directors. Uh, we have been pushing for support for directors for some time, and the funding, the bid was very much undersubscribed, and as a result, £1,000 was offered for directors from March of last year. I understand now that has been increased significantly. Perhaps you were too slow and too tight with the money. Would that be fair? Well, can I say I only make recommendations to the executive, as he knows. He's here a, a long time too. Uh, and the executive approves the funding allocations. The executive can change and amend any funding proposition that I bring. So they, when, the, when it comes out the other end, and I'm making a statement here today, it's on the basis of executive approval. Uh, for these allocations, uh, and similarly with that. Uh, and so, if uh, a department hadn't got sufficient money, it didn't slow down the scheme, it might have uh, reduced the amount they were paying out, and of course that has been uh, added to since, uh, and I would encourage that uh, to go out. But uh, I, I'm responsible for the schemes that my department administered, and there were difficulties with them as well, as uh, I acknowledge in all departments who had their budgets to spend, and then on top of that, collectively, we'd have £3 billion additional to spend. And while that's a welcome challenge, uh, nonetheless, it does present problems, uh, particularly in relation to pandemic when staff are working from home and there are communication issues uh, as well. So there, there have been challenges in all departments to try and spend this out, but we have allocated according to what the executive agreed were the priorities at any given time. Uh, and what we want to see now is departments acting with urgency over the next number of weeks to get schemes out. I call Pat Sheehan. Gormai, I've got a last count. Cor Logos, Buihas Leishan Ara, Asokta Reiches, and Sean Yu. I thank the Minister for this statement today. And could I ask the Minister, given the move to online, uh, online learning, uh, it's clear 
that this has highlighted the digital divide between students with unequal access to uh, suitable devices uh, 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 as well as Wi-Fi. I wonder would the Minister join with me in calling on the Education Minister to make a bid for money to purchase iPads, to purchase online uh, teaching resources uh, and to ensure that all students have access to Wi-Fi in their homes? Well, I think it's a, it's a good idea. Uh, there have been particular challenges, and if you speak to anybody in the education field, uh, they will tell you that particularly students who don't have access to Wi-Fi, and that affects a lot of uh, rural areas, including the one I represent, uh, where there are, are uh, communication issues and uh, communication infrastructure is not the same as it would be in perhaps more urban areas. Uh, but also, in, in particularly the poorer students, have, have difficulty in access to the the right type of, of uh, equipment in order to do that, and as a consequence, then they, they suffer more uh, uh, in, in terms of the, the closure of schools than, uh, than uh, perhaps those who have access to such things. I, I do understand, in conversation with private interests, that some support was offered to the Department for Education in terms of communication, uh, certainly in terms of broadband improvement. Uh, to, to schools or to homes where young people were having difficulty, but I'm not certain that that offer has been taken up. Uh, and I, I do intend to raise that with the, the Minister for Education. Uh, I know our own department is starting to look at a scheme uh, uh, in relation to providing uh, some IT support to vulnerable people generally, not the school population, but vulnerable people, and there is a very significant uptake in relation to that. Uh, and, and I think it is worth doing, uh, because as, as he says, uh, certainly the experience of the pandemic is one where that whole communication thing has become a real challenge for very many people, school age people, but uh, vulnerable people uh, at homes as well, uh, at home as well. Uh, and so I think any bids for support for that would be looked on very favourably by the executive. I call Stuart Dixon. Uh, Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your statement. Minister, while I appreciate that you don't have direct responsibility for, for running individual departments other than your own, nevertheless, do you not have concerns about those that underperform in relation to the delivery of funds that you have given to them? Uh, I'm thinking particularly of every scheme that the Department of the Economy has come up for uh, those uh, who find themselves under stress at this point in time in a, from, from their businesses because they are closed. But every time a scheme is devised, there, there remain many who are excluded. There is a great deal of frustration out there, particularly around uh, the, the, the reality that funds may be to returned to Treasury. So what action will you be taking to ensure, to encourage departmental ministers, that that will not be the situation? Yeah, well, I, I accept entirely that if, if, if we do end up in a situation where we aren't able to spend out the, the fund available to us, that those who haven't received will be obviously justifiably particularly aggrieved uh, with that situation, and that's why I have asked ministers to prioritise getting funding to those uh, sectors who, for one reason or another, uh, have missed out to date, uh, and then to try and support other sectors who are very much in need as well. Uh, and so I have, I have raised that at the executive meetings. I am now writing to ministers uh, to, to uh, reaffirm that and to encourage them to come forward with schemes. As I am expecting to hear from ministers over the course of this week, so we can take some decisions at Thursday's executive. Uh, and so I intend to keep the pressure on over the next couple of weeks to try and get that sorted. I call Jonathan Buckley. Speaker, um, I note this morning the Minister for Infrastructure on uh, talking about the new fund to clean up and restore alleyways that have, funding has been released uh, from the department. Uh, and while I welcome that in, Norman, in normal times, I do note that there is nothing in this to help support uncompleted developments going on for some 10 years, and I think in particular of my own constituency, Birchwood Manor, and I know many others across the country. The Minister has said in this chamber that if the funds were, were, were given, she would act on this. But we have no completed road surfaces, faulty sewage systems, no lights, and not enough money and bonds to complete out developments. This is second-class developments, and it should not be tolerated. If the Minister for Infrastructure came forward with such a scheme, would the Minister be minded to support that? Well, can I say in relation to the budget statement I did last week, I did announce as part of that that we had met a very significant capital uh, bid from the Department for Infrastructure, but we had also supplemented that with uh, a, a promised access £70 million of RRI borrowing to support Northern Ireland water, in terms of sewage and, and wastewater infrastructure. Uh, so, I, I mean, there are no specific bids being made for that type, because I know there are legal issues that complicate unfinished uh, 
unfinished estates because there are questions if the bond is, is, is activated and if they, the Department of Infrastructure do that, you effectively bankrupt uh, the, the contractor who was involved. And that's obviously a big decision to be taken, but people can't be left for years uh, in substandard housing states and have to wheel their wheelie bins out to the front of the road uh, from all of the houses in it o over the course of, of time. And I know there are similar estates in my own constituency as well. So there, there is a significant, I mean, the Department for Infrastructure had the largest capital budget they had ever received in last year's allocation. They have received a significant, albeit, uh, uh, you know, no, no, no department got all that they wanted this year because it's a challenging situation. But we have added to that of £70 million of RRI borrowing for infrastructure. Uh, and so I think it will be up for the Minister for Infrastructure to allocate according to her own priorities. And I, I think it's up to members. And uh, I'm sure this situation pertains in every constituency across the north to, to raise that issue of addressing these unfinished uh, Housing states to make sure that that becomes a priority for the Minister for Infrastructure. I call Mark Dorgan. The Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his statement. It will seem somewhat perverse, I think, to the public at a time when we have never had so many in so much need. We have businesses struggling to survive, we have people struggling to survive, and departments are now in Brewster's Millions territory, struggling and scurrying to spend hundreds of millions pounds against the clock. With specific regard to the Department for Communities, reduced requirement of £2 million for the COVID discretionary support grant, does the Minister see merit in the creation, even at this late stage, of an accessible and effective COVID isolation support grant that, that workers can avail of, as exists in other regions? Well, I know there has been some discussion in relation to, to that. Uh, and bear in mind, in, when we did the last allocation of this in December, we allocated everything out to departments, with the exception of the £150 million we're carrying over for rates uh, for the next financial year and £26 million of resources we'd left. Uh, and as I said, we were concerned at that stage we perhaps hadn't carried off enough over into this part of the financial year. Uh, so what we're dealing with now are returns from departments who made bids for funding that they said they needed and wanted to spend and haven't, for a variety of reasons, been able to do so. So, of course, it's a big challenge. Uh, and if there are specific uh, projects, I know that there has been some discussion in relation to that. Uh, I know there's a concern that the lack of support means that people are less likely to isolate and less likely to take time off and thereby, uh, you know, perhaps lead more uh, in terms of spreading of the virus uh, because they can't financially do anything else but go to work. Uh, so I'm very sympathetic to such a scheme and of course it will be for the Department of Communities to try and devise something uh, coming forward but I I'm sure uh, this uh, virus is going to be with us not just for the end of this financial year but into the new financial year as well and such support is needed. I call Jim Allister. Okay. So for all the whining about Her Majesty's Treasury. It turns out there's loads of money with 400 million unspent. I think, I've been in this House a number of years. I think this is the first time in a monitoring round I've ever heard of all departments having all their bids fully met. What a blessing to be in the United Kingdom. Could I ask the Minister? Where does the incompetence lie in regard to the failure to get this money out? You can't blame London. They've given it to you. The failure is in Stormont. Where is the incompetence? Well, can I say that, uh, I mean, if his argument for the union is that our begging bowl is occasionally filled, uh, then I, I think there are a lot of people in this part of the world have much higher ambitions uh, than just the occasional filling of our begging bowl in London. Uh, I think we'd be much better in charge of our own affairs. Then we might have known over the course of the year how much money we were intending to give out in relation to COVID and be able to allocate it accordingly. But what we are dealing with here are, are uh, returns from a range of departments. Uh, and while I know he wants to poke the finger at somebody and uh, allocate the blame and punish the guilty and all of the things that he normally does, uh, the reality is that I'm more, more concerned about getting this money spent and getting support to where it's needed. I call Jerry Carl. Thank you. The fact that uh, so much money has been unspent and maybe handed back why so many has fall, uh, fell through the cracks is a cruel joke. I wanted to ask the Minister, um, 
has here his department costed a zero COVID strategy for the North, uh, and what work, if any, has his department done with his counterpart in the, in the Irish government to cost an All Ireland zero COVID strategy to protect people from this deadly virus and new variants? Well, COVID strategies specifically will come from the Department of Health. They don't come from the Department of Finance. Uh, we allocate the funding according to the agreed priorities uh, of the executive. Uh, and so, if there were, and I, I would absolutely encourage a zero COVID strategy, and I would absolutely encourage North South uh, All Island approach to all of this. Uh, I think there are many examples from across the world where All Island approaches have been very effective in reducing transmission and keeping people safe. Uh, so it will be for a matter for the Department of Health, and I know they do have collaboration and cooperation with the Department of Health in the South. But uh, I do think there is much more that can and should be done in that regard. And that concludes questions to the Minister on his statement. I'd ask members to take their ease for a few moments before the next item of business.